Welcome to our DVD release highlighting the fascinating Bomark surface-to-air missile. I'm James Duffy and I'm the producer of this DVD. The digital transfers of the film you're about to see were all commissioned especially for this DVD package, working directly from the 16mm and 35mm film stocks that were shot by Air Force and contractor employees throughout the Bomark development process. It consists of both raw, unedited silent film and some edited film elements with sound. Some of the audio elements have been lost over the years, so we've added some commentary to sections as appropriate, such as this 1953 Bomark briefing film. Commentary has also been added to the section on Bomark and X-10 target drone testing, and we've also added a section illustrating a Bomark launch failure. And of course, the DVD also includes our signature Modeler's Notes audio track. The Bomark was conceived almost as much as a pilotless supersonic cruise aircraft than a true surface-to-air missile. It effectively was a joint U.S.-Canadian program following the establishment of the North American Air Defense Command, or NORAD, in 1957. Intriguingly, the original designation for the Bomark system, XF-99, followed the current convention for fighter aircraft and not for missiles. Again, the Air Force saw this more as an unpiloted aircraft than a true surface-to-air missile. The Bomark was the only surface-to-air missile ever developed by the U.S. Air Force. All other U.S. surface-to-air missile systems were under the control of the U.S. Army and continue under Army control to this day. Development of the Bomark weapon system began soon after World War II ended, with the investigation into the potential of ramjet power via Boeing's GAPA project, or the Ground-to-Air Pilotless Aircraft Program. GAPA was conceived strictly as a research project, not a weapon system. It provided critical data that led directly to Bomark development. Over 100 GAPA flights flew from 1946 until 1949, and on some flights the system reached a maximum altitude of 59,000 feet. GAPA looked very much like the sounding rockets of the era. The difference was that the second stage utilized ramjet power as opposed to conventional solid propellant or liquid propellant rocket power. The success of the GAPA project, coupled with the data gathered throughout that project, led directly to the overall concept of the BOMARC weapon system. BOMARC was intended to protect North America, both the United States and Canada, from the threat of incoming Soviet bombers. The system would boost under rocket power and then transition to ramjet power when adequate airspeed was reached. The BOMARC system could be equipped with either conventional or nuclear payloads. Elsewhere on this DVD package, you'll find some footage showing a BOMARC intercept strike from the perspective of a QB-17 target aircraft. The overall Bomark weapon system consisted not only of the Bomark missile hardware, but also the IBM SAGE computer system. SAGE computers were massive analog computer systems. They required large football field sized buildings to house the computer, and they had dedicated industrial cooling facilities. The SAGE computers detected, tracked, and directed the response to incoming enemy aircraft. In effect, they were military aircraft control systems. The SAGE system worked not only with the Bomark missile system, but with many of the other aircraft and weapon systems of, of the day throughout North America. Production of the Bomark system began in 1951 when a contract was awarded to Boeing. The name Bomark actually derives from a combination of Boeing and the Michigan Aeronautical Research Center Boeing's research partner on the Bomark project. Flight testing began in 1952 and continued through 1955. At that time, test flights took on a more operational rather than a developmental nature. The first successful target intercept 
of a fully integrated Bomark SAGE system occurred in 1958, and the first Bomark squadron became operational in September of 1959. There were two different models of Bomark. The first, the A model, had a liquid booster and a range of 200 miles. The downside of the A model was that it could take as long as two minutes to fuel the missile before launch, which reduced the missile's effectiveness as an interceptor. Later, the B model was developed. It featured a solid booster. It was always ready for launch. It also had slightly upgraded Marquardt ramjet engines, and the range on the system was pushed out to 400 miles. The B model also featured a slightly upgraded terminal homing system. The way that the homing system on Bomark worked, the SAGE computer would guide the missile into the general area of the target aircraft, then the onboard terminal homing system would take over and actually guide the Bomark into that aircraft the last 10 miles or so. The first launch of a B model Bomark occurred in 1959, and the first successful intercept of the B model occurred in 1960 when a Regulus drone was intercepted. The first Bomark B squadron became operational in June of 61, and eventually all of the A models were replaced by the solid booster B models. Both the A and the B model Bomarks were 45 feet long and had a 35 inch major diameter. Wingspan on both was 18 feet 2 inches and had a top speed of Mach 2.5 with a ceiling of 80,000 feet. The B model stretched that out to as much as 100,000 feet if necessary. Boeing built over 700 production Bomark missiles between 1957 and 1964 and also constructed over 420 launch pads or shelters, launch shelters, that you can see throughout this DVD. These shelters, also called coffins, were very lightly built. They were designed to split open when an alert was issued, and then the Bomark would be raised into launch position vertically. The Bomark would launch on rocket power, either the liquid or solid power that we discussed for the A and B models, then transition to ramjet propulsion when sufficient velocity was reached. The SAGE system would guide the Bomark from launch into the general vicinity of the target aircraft. And again, about 10 miles out from the target, the Bomark's onboard terminal homing system would take over and complete the intercept. As we mentioned earlier, Bomark was not exclusively a United States Air Force project. Canada also participated very much in the operational deployment of the weapon system. Bomark effectively ended development of the Avro Aero, which was Canada's state-of-the-art fighter interceptor that they had in development in the 50s. That cancellation occurred in 1959. It unfortunately removed Canada from the ranks of countries developing frontline tactical aircraft. Following the cancellation of the Aero project, there was a massive attrition of engineering talent from Canada to the United States in support of the U.S. space program. There are those who believe that uh, the United States would not have gotten to the moon as quickly as they did had they not had that engineering talent available from Canada. Interesting, many other aero engineers went on to England where their uh, experience with supersonic aircraft was indispensable in the development of the Concorde supersonic transport. The decision to deploy nuclear warheads on Bomark missiles in Canada uh, led to a young Canadian journalist by the name of Pierre Trudeau to get involved more directly in the world of politics. This eventually led to his election as prime minister and one of his main platform planks was to withdraw the Bomark system from Canada. This did eventually occur in the 1970s, although that withdrawal was due as much to the system becoming obsolete as to Trudeau's political efforts. After being withdrawn from service in the early 70s, many Bomark missiles were converted to drone configurations under the CQM 10A and 10B designations and were used as high-speed target drones. 
Most of the Bomark drones were flown from pads at California's Vandenberg Air Force Base, and launches occurred as late as 1982. If you'd like to actually see a Bomark missile, many of them survive to this day. There's one on display at the Canadian Aviation Museum. They're also at the Air Force Armament Museum at Elgin Air Force Base in Florida. The Air Force Space and Missile Museum at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, also in Florida. And perhaps most famously, there's one at the National Museum of the United States Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. There's also a Bomark on display, although it's a little tricky to get to, at the U.S. Air Force History and Traditions Museum at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm.